This episode continues an exchange I've been having with Edward D. Andrews regarding translating Genesis 1-1 and translation philosophy. You can follow the entire exchange by using the links at the beginning of the blog post upon which this episode is based. And, as always, there's a link to the blog post in the show notes. This episode is my response to a comment Edward Andrews made on the blog post I read last episode. So, let's get into it. Hi, Edward. I hope you're doing well since our last exchange. First, I want to express that I appreciate you saying that you may have mistaken my intended purpose. It never bodes well when someone is unwilling to consider the possibility that they may have mistaken the meaning of their conversation partner. It's just such a normal thing to happen, especially when two people are only beginning to interact. I certainly don't take misunderstandings personally or regard it as an offense. While I'll try my best to understand you accurately, there's always a chance that I'll misunderstand something you say. So if that happens, please feel free to let me know and to clarify your meaning. Okay, so to the subject of literal translation. In your comment on my previous blog post, you mentioned that if two translations are literal, they should read the same. Specifically, you said, quote, Now both are not literal translations. If both were literal translations, then they would read the same. End quote. I'm not entirely sure what you mean by this. On the surface, it sounds like you're saying that if two translations differ in their wording, they can't both be literal translations. But this would imply that there can only be one literal translation, which isn't the impression I've been getting from other things you've said. For example, in your article responding to my original post on Genesis, you identified several translations that you consider, quote-unquote, literal translations. The list you gave is KJV, YLT, ASV, RSV, NASV, and UASV. Now, obviously, these translations are not exactly the same. Their wordings differ from one another on numerous occasions. Maybe in your comment, you were using the word literal in a more strict sense. If that's the case, I'm totally fine with it, so long as we keep in mind that you use it in a less strict sense as well since you listed several translations that differ from one another as being, quote-unquote, literal translations. When I said in my response to you that both translations I compared in my original post were quite literal word-for-word translations of Genesis 1-1, I was using the word literal in a sense more akin to how you used it in your blog post. In other words, I was using it in a sense that allows for differences in wording. Why do I consider both translations of Genesis 1-1 to be quite literal? Probably for the same reason you consider both the KJV and Young's literal translation to be literal, even though they're quite different. Here's how I put it in my last post. Quote, And both translations I consider are actually quite literal word-for-word translations of Genesis 1-1. In both cases, the English words map easily and directly onto the Hebrew words, which is quite different from the interpretive translations Leland Riken discussed in what you quoted from him. So, here are the English words of the JPS and Robert Alter translations mapped onto the Hebrew words. I'll read alternating between Hebrew and English, first the Hebrew, then the English. For those of you who aren't familiar with Hebrew, the word order might seem really weird, but that's just because Hebrew sentences arrange words in a different order from English. Okay, here it is. Bereshit, when began, bara, to create, Elohim, God, et hashamayim, heaven, ve'et ha'aretz, and earth. My point here isn't to say that this is the best translation. I myself would translate it differently, as I mentioned in my last post. I've mapped the words here just to illustrate what I meant by saying it's a quite literal word-for-word translation. But as I said in my last post, I prefer Young's literal translation here. It says, In the beginning of God's preparing the heavens and the earth, the earth hath existed, waste and void, etc. Since you acknowledge this as a literal translation, I'd point you to it over the JPS and Robert Alter translations. Young's literal translation accurately translates the two elements that were the main point of my original post on this topic, namely, 
that the first word of the Hebrew text is in a construct state, and Genesis 1-1 is not a complete sentence. I agree with you that wording matters, and that it impacts the meaning of a text. Saying, in the beginning, conveys a different meaning than in the beginning of, which is why knowing that in the beginning of more literally and accurately translates the Hebrew text is so important. I'm sure we could go back and forth discussing whether or in what sense a given translation might be literal. But honestly, that's not what I'm wanting to focus on. As I said in my original post, the only way to really measure to what extent a translation is accurate is to compare it to the original. Since we're discussing its meaning in English, translation is inevitably involved. But still, my focus is on the meaning of the original as it was even before the English language came into existence. The original says, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemaim ve'et ha'aretz. Is this referring to an ultimate origin that it calls the beginning, and saying that during that beginning God created the heavens and the earth? Or is it referring to the beginning of God creating the heavens and the earth, and saying in verse 2 what it was like at the start of that process? This question can be answered without considering any translation or translation philosophy. The author knew what he was saying, and the original audience understood it, all purely in Hebrew. And again, in Hebrew, the answer is clear. It refers to the beginning of God creating the heavens and the earth. And verse 2 is saying what things were like at the beginning of that process. When it comes to translating this passage into English, the translation should inform the reader of the facts of the Hebrew text, including these facts. I had considered making an additional post addressing something else you said in your comment, but conversations that go in multiple directions at once can be hard to keep track of. Plus, I try to find the most fruitful direction for discussion, and since this is a public conversation, one that will be of benefit to those listening in. Alright, that's the end of my reply. And actually, at the time of recording this, it's the most recent part of the conversation. On another note, if while listening to these podcasts on translating Genesis 1-1, you thought, man, I'd like to learn Hebrew, there's actually a great resource I came across recently that I can wholeheartedly recommend to you. It's a YouTube channel, so, you know, it's free, called Aleph with Beth. Their videos are designed to be watched in order, and it walks you through the process of learning ancient Hebrew in a very intuitive and fun way. Most Hebrew courses out there are very focused on grammar, which is great and even necessary for an analytical understanding of the language. The courses I've been taking from the Israel Institute of Biblical Studies are pretty grammar-heavy, and I've been loving it. Yet, I have to say, I've also been loving Aleph with Beth's YouTube videos recently. Grammar helps you analyze a language, but the approach used by Aleph with Beth helps you build intuitions about the language. There's a lot more that could be said, but I recommend just checking it out for yourself. They also have a website with a resources section with additional content to go along with their videos like interactive quizzes, a schedule to follow, and a lot more. I've included links in the show notes to both their YouTube channel and website. Thanks for listening. Peace. Or as they say in Hebrew, Shalom. Mm -hmm.